All right, good morning, everybody. Today, we are on part two of St. Augustine's Confessions. I think it's part two of six, if I read the syllabus right. We are planning to do six uh, total. The pace seemed more reasonable. This is a longer book. Our last book was, uh, like we made a joke of, I think it's about 120 pages. And this book's like 350. So it's like more than double, right? So I gave a 150-page book four classes i can give a 300 page book at least six this, and so far i would i think except for plato's republic i think this is our longest book so far so it's probably tied with the republic for length uh the only one that's going to be longer is tale of the heike if you haven't picked it up yet although if you haven't opened it tale of the heike is actually mostly poetry on the style so it's a little bit inflated like the size of the book, but it's, it's a heifer, it's a big book. All right, so today we're going to start, we're going to keep going with Confessions. I will probably do, uh, finish, well obviously we'll finish book one, that's only one slide, we almost finished that, but then uh, we'll definitely finish book two, and I hope to finish, or get like halfway through book three, but uh, no rush, I'd rather do like always, quality of content over keeping some imaginary um, timeline that is completely arbitrary and made by me, so, <laughs> it's not completely arbitrary, that's untrue. It is, uh, I do have a plan, but, uh, you know, plus or minus a little bit, it's not going to hurt anything. Although, in this book specifically, I do want, the, I, I, one could argue, the best chapters, philosophically speaking, are 11, 12, 13, which are the last three chapters of the book. So, uh, I'd really like to get to 11, 12, 13, make sure we get a class or two out of that. They're just, oh my goodness. They, uh, really great philosophy just pure philosophy is just dripping it's very interesting so here's hoping i can mostly keep my pace and uh if we heard if my voice sounds more even more scraggly than normal that's just uh yeah a long teaching week and lots of full office hours all right so we we got to near the end of book one today our, our last class um so, pretty good pace. Okay, so where we left off, um, we were talking about... Oh yeah, uh, school, right, we, we ended at school with uh, a quote of Augustine's from school beatings and his opinion on them. Uh, horrible, short, short version, right? They were not great. Uh, that shouldn't shock anyone, I guess. But uh, most of human history, right, some kind of corporal punishment is... Uh, part of education. So, it's what it is. Uh, although Augustine probably argues it's not very effective. Okay, so next we then talk about getting more into his philosophy. Like we said, this book is a combination of theology, philosophy, how to live, teaching new Christians, and his life story. So it's all, uh, it's all mixed together. Uh, and then he makes an interesting, which I would say, it's not just interesting, but it's a, a Christian uh, theology point here. If you're looking at your book, it's at 10. He said, yet I sinned, O Lord my God, creator and arbiter of all natural things, but arbiter only, not creator of sin. It's an important difference, which again, it's not. We'll talk about Manichaeism a little bit. Today, actually, it's the uh, the heresy, actually, that he does for 10 years of his life. But uh, it's the point that God is good and doesn't make sin, but he's an arbitrator, right? Arbitrate is like to judge. So he judges it, but he's not the creator of it. Um, so the, again, this is one of those philosophy points. So he said, I sinned, O Lord, by disobeying my parents and the masters whom I have spoken. Because we're still in the school mode, right? So... He said, uh, for whatever purpose they had in mind, I later on might have put to good use all the things which they wanted me to learn. And again, a lot of this is an examine, right? If you don't examine. Uh, because it's a confession, he's trying to figure stuff out. Um, right? It's not just saying, like, oh, I did a bad thing. But uh, he's a philosopher, really, in his heart, uh, St. Augustine. So he's trying to figure out, like, what's the point? Right, like, so uh, he says, I was disobedient not because I chose something better than they proposed to me, but simply for the love of games. So interesting there, again, right, um, kind of morally, it's okay to be disobedient with kind of, um, how can you say it, not fully just authority, 
But it has to be for a better good. It can't be just, I like to play. <laughs> Again, the, these kind of principles you can start to see in the book, uh, which can make it, uh, depending on kind of your personality, or not even your, like, one person's, but like your frame of mind when reading a book, different people see different things at different times when they read the same book. Although, I, uh, the, my favorite definition of a great book is a book that is good in your mind after you read it, and then on multiple reads you get something new. That is a definition from a, a philosopher I've read, and I thought it was good. Bertram Russell, actually. I mean, I think it's a pretty good estimation of a great book. Um, is there anything else I want from here? Uh, he critiques uh, kind of unjust authority here, too. He says, uh, he mentions uh, he likes games, he likes to win, um, or have my ears tickled by the make-believe of the stage, which only made them itch more as time went on, my eyes shone more to the same eager curiosity because I wanted to, to see the shows, the sports, with the grown-ups enjoyed. Um... And the patrons, people who sponsored these uh, theater, were held in esteem. And um, yet these same parents willingly allowed their children to be flogged if they are distracted by these displays from the studies which are supposed to fit them to grow rich and give them the same sort of shows themselves. So he points out there's kind of a hypocrisy in parents, right? So if you, if you skip your study to go to a play which is sponsored by a supposedly eminent man, doesn't that not make sense, right? It's a, it's every young person's critique of elder people, right? Like, do as I say, not as I do, right? Like, that is aggravating. And I'll be honest, as somebody who, when I was a youth, found that horribly annoying, even St. Augustine points out. Um, and he, this is so funny. Um, look on these such things with pity, <laughs> O Lord, and free us who now call upon you from such delusions. So he literally calls like parents having horrible double standards as a delusion. So it's an interesting kind of side tangent here, which I thought is interesting. Uh, all right, keep going. 11, we get into what he was taught as a boy, like kind of ethically, and we get a little near-death experience here too. So basically his mom taught him Christian basics as a kid, basically. That's what this part's about. Um, but he was not baptized. He meant, They mentioned, as a child, I was taken suddenly with an ill disorder of the stomach on the point of death. You, and then he, he talks to God, right? You, my God, are my guardian. And you didn't, you didn't, you know, you're my mom's faith helped. Uh, and they almost gave him baptism. But they didn't. And the reason is here is interesting. My earthly mother was deeply anxious because of the pure faith in her heart. She was in great labor to ensure my eternal salvation. She did not been a birth. Um, let's see, what's her reason here? So basically, if you don't know anything about Christianity, uh, bapti baptism's a, like a sacrament. It says here, uh, sacrament of salvation, washed clean by knowing you, Lord Jesus, for the pardon of my sins. So baptism is one of the things Christians do to like acknowledge. Uh, their reception to the faith when it's thought to wash your sins away but here is the thing the reason the mom didn't do it um, she waited because he in, should he defile himself again after baptism the guilt of pollution would be greater and more dangerous so the mom kind of had the inkling like ah, I think he's got some ways to go let's uh, let's dunk him later <laughs> and uh, yeah St. Augustine waited as an adult to get baptized so interesting uh, great. So that's just the point here. Is there anything else I want to point out? Ooh, doo -doo. And he just asks God, like every other time, right? He says, is my mom right? He says, like, uh, for what purpose was my baptism postponed? Um, was it for my good that the range which held me from sin were slackened? Or is it untrue they were slackened? He's not sure. Like, he's trying to figure out... And, and the reason he's asking these questions, if you're curious, it's been a kind of... Uh, Christians still fight about it. <laughs> Like, should you baptize children or wait till they're adults? Because basically the idea is kids can't consent, but the other opinion is, like, if God is God, he can help a kid, you know. 
he can give help to a kid even if the kid's not fully consenting of it yet. The parents can c c consent for them kind of thing. Uh, this is still a big fight in, uh, we'll say, among people in the same denomination and among denominations. It's interesting, though. All right. Next one. Greek language distasteful. I love this. Um... Here we go. Uh, these temptations were brought to less of a danger in boyhood than in adolescence, but even as a boy I did not care for lessons, and I disliked being forced to study. He said, at the same time, all the same I was compelled to learn, and good came of it as a result, though not of my own making. For I would have not studied, ha oh, I would have would not have studied at all had I been obliged to do so. And he mentions, what a person does against his will is not to his own credit, even if what he does is good himself. Now that's an interesting moral point. Uh, you can't actually force someone to be moral as part of education. That wasn't related to the Greek, but uh, he next he points out, I cannot fully understand why the Greek language, which I learned as a child, is so was so distasteful to me. <laughs> So he's forced to learn good things, and he acknowledges they're good, but he still doesn't understand why he hated Greek so much. He mentions, I love Latin. Not the elementary lessons, but those which I studied later under teachers of literature. The first lessons in Latin were reading, writing, and counting. But they were much less irksome than the proposition as any study in Greek. And he mentions he preferred basic Latin instead of advanced Latin because at least it was practical skills. Like he learned reading and writing and the basics, and then basically the advanced, he learned only poetry and kind of like what he would term as like useless things. Uh, he mentioned, I learned the lament, the death of Ditto, who killed herself for love, while all the time in the midst of these things I was dying, separate from you, my God. So he's like, I was learning kind of useless things, even though the skills I learned was useful. So again, he's uh, pretty hard on himself here. Let me see what else do I want next. Um, we did that, and I think he has more on the difficulty of Greek. Let me see here. So he does a page and a half on this, and then he goes to, uh, if this was so, um, basically it's why he doesn't like Greek poetry for children. He's very platonic in that way. Um, so if this was so, why did I dislike Greek literature? which tells these tales as much as Greek language itself. So at this time, he really liked the theater and plays. Why wouldn't he have liked Greek literature? He said, nevertheless, as a boy, I found little to my taste. I suppose the Greek boys think the same about Virgil, which is the uh, Latin epic, when they are forced to study him, and f as we are forced to study Homer. Um, and he mentions, of course, learning foreign language is hard. And here we go. This is the worst part. Uh, we, you, understandably, I understood not a single word and was constantly subjected to violent threats and cruel punishments, cruel punishments, to make me learn. And he mentions as a baby he learned Latin from his mother and his family and it was much more fun. Whereas, you know, he didn't get beat to learn Latin. He says here, I learned it without being forced by threats of punishment because it was my own wish to be able to give expression to my thoughts. Here we go, and this is an interesting thesis he has here. Uh, this clearly shows that we learn better in a free spirit of curiosity than under fear and compulsion. Hmm. So, an interesting, like, pedag pedagogical point, right? But, you know, perhaps beating people doesn't help them learn well. <laughs> All right. And let's see, this one. Uh, 50. I have lots of notes, so i got to check it all. And on that same note, uh, 15, he says, uh, Grant my prayer, Lord, not to allow my soul to wilt under the discipline which you prescribe. Let me not tire of thanking you for your mercy and rescuing me from my wicked ways, so that you may be sweeter to me than the joys which used to tempt me. So he's just at, he's saying, uh, help me not to wilt under punishments. Uh, and let's see here, is there anything else I want to read on this one? And he's actually, he this is where he's a little bit grateful, even though the book's called Confessions. He, uh, 
In your service, I want to use whatever good I learned as a boy. I can speak and write and read and count, and I want these things to be used to serve you. So he still finds, like, learning is still a good, right? Just, uh, he says, it is true these studies taught me many useful words, but at the same time, words can be learned to studying something that matters. And this is the safe course for a boy to follow. Again, I'm I'll mention this one. Uh, it's interesting, that direct connection to Plato. Now, do we think that uh, St. Augustine had read The Republic? He at least was very familiar with Neoplatonist thought, but probably likely he also had read The Republic and had, a, you know, understood the Platonist idea of education. So perhaps it's not the best to uh, teach kids, you know, stories that tell them to kill themselves. Uh, not a bad critique, actually. Ah! Uh, and again, one of his big themes of the book is kind of, um, where's this? It's uh, everybody getting carried away by sin. So he's not actually special here. Let me see this. This is 16. And he mentioned this too. Uh, this is a good quote, so I'm going to read it. He says, uh, top of 16, he says, but we are carried away by custom to our own undoing, and this is hard to struggle against the stream. Will this torrent never dry up? How much longer will it sweep the sons of Adam down to the vast, terrible sea, which cannot be easily passed even by those who climb to the Ark of the Cross? Um, and he mentions, like, how custom can get in the way of, like, true understanding. He gives examples. Uh, this traditional education taught me that Jupiter punishes the wicked with thunderbolts, yet commit adultery. The two roles are quite incompatible, right? This is also very platonic, right? Uh, the Greek gods, and the who became the Latin gods, weren't consistent, right? And if you're a consistent, if you have consistent philosophy, you can't follow them. Or if you follow them, you also aren't consistent. He said, all the same, he represented in his way the results of those who follow his example in adultery can put a bold face to it by making false pretenses of thunder. But can any schoolmaster in his gown listen unperturbed to a man who challenges him on his own ground and says, quote, Homer invented these stories and attributed human sins to the gods. He would have done better to provide men with examples of divine goodness. And they mentioned that Homer basically invented it. And, uh, to kind of, like, hide people's, like, man's own crime. Uh... And he says, yet human children are pitched into the hellish torrent together with fees which are paid to have their taught lessons like this. Right? Uh, again, this is both a Christian critique, but it's also a Neoplatonist critique. Uh, should we teach kids that, like, the, the head god is not just, right? Like, he'll strike you with a thunderbolt, but he'll bang anything that moves. You're like, mm hmm, that god doesn't feel very, uh, like, it's going to make it. And here's the thing, right? Didn't make it. So it's, it's, it's kind of just in that way. Even if you're not a Christian, right, you can say probably if we're going to make gods, God should be consistent. And he mentions theater and Jupiter, which they studied. Um, and it, where Jupiter, as he says, quote, incites himself to lechery as though he were a heaven. oh, he had heavenly authority for it. And he mentions another character here who uh, uses the god as an excuse for his own lechery. He says here, quote, this is from a play, what a god he is, his mighty thunder rocks the sky from end to end. You may say I'm only a man, and thundering is beyond my power, but I played the rest part well enough, and willingly too. The words are certainly not learnt, this is Augustine again, uh, any more easily of reason of the filthy moral, but filth is committed with greater confidence as a result of learning the words. Basically, uh, the education itself kind of programmed people the wrong way. Uh, it's interesting. And he also gets into how to waste your... Uh, kind of talent. He says, uh, this is 17, let me tell you, my God, how I squandered the brains you gave me on foolish delusions. Uh, and he mentions he, because he got too much into poetry and these kind of, um, like they spend a lot of time in their school, like rewriting classic theater and stories. 
which didn't have good morals in them. And he's like, man, what a waste of our ability. And he mentions, because he actually did well and he got praise for it, and he asked, why would I get praise for it? Why did my recitation win more praise than those of many other boys in my class? Surely it was all such smoke without fire. Was there no other subject in which I might have sharpened my wits and my tongue? <laughs> so looking back, he's like, man, I was educated badly. But you know, what's a kid going to do, to be fair? Uh, interesting, too, he makes one last education point here. Let me see. Um... Nineteen. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And he, he basically meant she wasted his time in childhood getting ready for these kind of like well, poetry tournaments. And he says, uh, when I was already being prepared for tournaments by training, which taught me to have horror of faulty grammar instead of teaching me, when I committed these faults, not to envy others who avoided them. He's like. It would have been great if I was taught some ethics in my education, <laughs> not just technicalities of like how to win or how to speak well. So Romans were very, if you're curious, Roman education, especially non-Christian Roman education, was very, you could say all practical. Uh, we talked about the Sto the um, not the Stoics, the uh, Sophists, when we talked about Plato. They, they had much more of a Sophist view of rhetoric. Right? It's like rhetoric is for power, and education is for the money you can gain, and the benefits, and the wealth. They weren't really worried about like education like a moral education. That just wasn't a Roman thing. Especially late Roman Empire. Early Roman Empire, they had more moral teachings, but by the time they were like a, a giant, non-democratic, you know, emp like a true empire, it was just pure, what benefit can you gain from education? So, a very different kind of change. Or you could argue St. Augustine is the the, the 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 turning back towards more of a moral education. Because it's probably pretty easy to argue for the next thousand years or so in Europe, uh, moral education was much more common than uh, like a rhetorical education. So there's something there too. All right. Uh, any questions about book one before we go to book two? And I will switch my notes. And my daughter is... Uh, not in a good mood today. Alright, ten more seconds. That's a great question. Somebody asks, if God didn't create sin and evil, yet he created man who is sinful, where did the evil stem from its origin? So, um, the, the, the kind of orthodox answer for this is, strictly speaking, definitionally, um, sin is breaking God's laws, and then evil is going away from God. So God cr didn't create evil, but he created, and as Augustine would say if you read his other works too, he, God created angels and men who were given the capacity of free will. So through the capacity and uh, the kind of justification for that is God has free will, right? So if, if uh, Christians are right and God has made man in his image, part of the image is the ability to choose him or not. So the ability to choose is the ability to sin, a.k.a. violate God's law, and to do evil, which is, definitionally speaking, to move away from God. So it's like man created God or God created man, sorry. God created man with a bit of his spark, which includes the ability to reject him. Does that make sense? So, for, like, for example, for your choice, uh, the way Augustine, I think, would explain it is something like, for your choice towards God to be meaningful at all, like not just a robot, the, the, the choice of rejection must also exist. Does that make sense? It's a really good question. By the way, uh, the person who asked this question, you officially asked the hardest question in all of morality. 
<laughs> and I'm, that's why I'm giving you St. Augustine's answer. And it's, it's, it's why he is considered to be uh, one of the, I mean, they call him a doctor of the church, but like a great thinker is because he's trying to wrestle with the, that's one reason he's going so deep into the sin stuff. Um, it is the hardest question for all of human existence, right? Like, why do we suffer? Why is there evil in the world? You know, why do bad things happen to good people, right? Like, that's a great question. Actually, St. Augustine's much longer other book, the major theme of that book is like, why does good, th why do good things, bad things happen to good people? You know, why is there evil in the world? What is, you know, the structure of God's reality? That's his whole other book, which I've also read, by the way. Um, but uh, I'm not doing it this class, but I happen to know his answers from it. Any other questions? I see one more person typing, so I'll give it a second. Although I'll move us to the new slide. Here we go. All right. If anybody else has a question, if you type it, I'll answer it when it pops up. Okay. Um, book two. Uh, this one is, uh, I'm not going to say much maligned. Uh, but my other class, we have a textbook we use, and it's written by a secular atheist. That guy cannot stand this book. Um, why not? Book two, if I was going to paraphrase, it's basically this, right? It's the abominable things he did as a child. And he says, done in those days. So he kind of wants to understand, this is kind of his exposition on, like, both the bad things he did, but he's trying to understand basically the student's question, right? Sam, he's like, what is... What are the bad things we did? What are the things I should be doing? Um, he says, so uh, book, this is 43, right? Book 2, section 1, he says, hmm. he, It's basically his goal to kind of, uh, He says it here, memory, uh, The memory of, quote-unquote, all his sins are bitter, but it will help me savor your sweetness, which is God. Which is does not deceive, but brings a real joy and never fails. So he's, he's trying to repent, and by like recounting it and trying to like meditate on like the the bad things he did as a kid, and like why would one do them? So this is almost like a psychological meditation on it. That's a great question. Uh, somebody asks, does Saint Augustine have a similar view to Marcus about the importance of following your reason in order to correctly follow God? Um. To a point, um, Augustine is much more of a grace guy, which the Stoics are not. Grace is like undeserved uh, goodness, right? So for St. Augustine, reason can get you part of the way there. And he'll talk about it in book three and four, I think, especially, where he starts to get very interested in wisdom. So wisdom can get you there partially, but at a certain point... Uh, Augustine, and the whole book really, Augustine's much more concerned with grace. So basically, reason's not the only thing that gets you to God for Augustine. It's also like, because God has positive traits that care about you, he draws you to him. Does that make sense? So it's, a, it's not just you enthroning your reason. It's you kind of being led by a, a being that actually cares you exist. If that makes sense. So it's much more, uh, it's, it's much less self-focused. And uh, you can tell just by the tone, right? Like, while I would argue that Marcus is probably also very effacing, right? Marcus really is very self-effacing. It's hard to argue that in this, if you read Confessions, Augustine is even more effacing. Does that make sense? Like, he's very aware that he, like, I am not worthy could be the... The sub that's like the subtitle of this book, <laughs> right? So that's uh, for sure a thing. Exactly. So your reason is insufficient because he was, you know, he, um, basically you can argue his education he was getting at this book one, book two was reasonable education. It just wasn't enough. Yeah, there's something above reason for sure. Uh, Christians would call it revelation, right? But uh. It's, he'll talk about like a lot about grace and mercy in this book, right? So basically God's allowing you to approach him. It's not like you, like, I am so great. I have done all the work myself. 
my reason is enthroned in me and I see God. Now don't get me wrong, it, um, later Christian thinkers do a pain, they do have some opinion that like there is a intellectual course to God, but even that right like that if 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 Christians were right, it would require God giving you an intellect strong enough to figure that out. So in the end, it all goes back to him. Yeah, it's much more. I would say Aurelius is both God and you focused, and Augustine is much more God focused. Does that make sense? Like I don't think they disagree. They, I mean, they do disagree, but. I don't think they're like completely non-complementary. I just think the emphasis is much more strongly on God than your enthroned reason. That's a great question, though. Hopefully that was it. That's my answer, anyway, from somebody who's read both of them. Hopefully that helped. Great. Um, this is an interesting one, too. Uh, just like Marcus Aurelius, I think, um, St. Augustine can sound very modern at times. Uh, book 2, Section 2. He says, I cared for nothing but to love and be loved. <laughs> right? This is very much like, oh, this sounds, uh, this sounds like the cry of, you know, every contemporary 21st century kid, right? Like, not kid, but, you know, a young adult. Um, you know, it's, it, and he, he goes, um, where's this? But my love went beyond affection of one mind for another, beyond the arc of the bright beam of friendship. So those are like, we you say, like positive love, right? He goes, bodily desire, like a morass, and adolescent sex welling up within me exuded mists which clouded over and obscured my heart, so that I could not distinguish the clear light of true love from the murk of lust. <laughs> I'm only laughing because one thing that makes St. Augustine so great, he, he, his turn is a phrase. Uh, are amazing. I think he basically just described being a teenager there. Like, that's, you know... <laughs> that's, I'm not even laughing. It's just, like, that's just, you know, it's a pretty... It's just his wording is so great. Um, I mean, right after that, he says, In my tender youth, they swept me away over the precipice of my body's appetites and plunged me in the whirlpool of sin. You're just like, man, this guy... This guy's got away with words. And he, just, he goes into it, basically, too, is uh, how far he gets away from, uh, basically, you know, from God. Um, you know, he says, instead I was ferment, uh, fomented of wickedness. I just deserted you and allowed myself to be carried away by the sweep of the tide. Uh, I broke all your lawful bounds and did not escape your lash. For what man can escape it? You're, you were always present, angry and merciful at once, strewing the pangs of bitterness over all my lawless pleasures to lead me back to look for others unallied with pain. So, and he makes an interesting uh, point here at the end of four. He says, quote, My family made no effort to save me from my, uh, from my fall by marriage. Their only concern was that I should learn how to make a good speech and how to persuade others with my word. So even his family and his mom, who's a Christian, they're just kind of worried about his success uh, more than anything. And then after that, uh, here we go. He was sent to Carthage for school. Actually, one of our pictures today is of Carthage. Um, actually, his dad, who wasn't very rich, they mentioned his dad was a modest citizen of Thagras, whose determination was greater than his means, saved up money to send me farther afield to Carthage. So at this time, this is not the Carthage you think of, like Hannibal's Carthage, uh, because the uh, Romans salted the land and uh, burned the city to the ground. This is still Carthage, but they rebuilt it. It's a Roman city now. Um... And he says, no one had anything but praise for my father, who, despite his slender resources, was ready to provide his son with all that was needed to enable him to travel far for the purpose of study. Probably some of you can sympathize with that. Many of our townsmen, far richer than my father, went to no trouble to, for their children's sake. And he, he, he laments, though, his dad doesn't actually care about his moral upbringing. He said he only cared that I should be, have a fertile tongue, leaving my heart to bear none of your fruits, my God, though you were the only master true and good of its husbandry. 
And he mentioned uh, for a certain time he was forced, while they were saving up money, I think he was 16, uh, he was forced to live at home with his family. And he mentions the brambles of lust grew high above my head and there was no one to root them out. Certainly not my father. And, and then he mentions this. Do I have it on here? I don't have it on here. But he mentions, uh, he was at the public, he says that one day at the public baths he saw the signs of active virility coming to life in me, and this was enough to make him relish the thought of having grandchildren. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, I don't think I'm going to explain the male anatomy to you, but if you can figure it out, that's great. And this is the funniest part. This is how you know it's a real story. He was happy to tell my mother about it. <laughs> For his happiness was due to the intoxication which causes the world to forget you, forget you, its creator, and to love the things you have created instead of loving you, because the world is drunk with the invisible wine of its own perverted earthbound will. Um, and then the mom, she says, in her piety became alarmed and apprehensive, and although I had not been baptized, she began to dread that I might follow the crooked path of those who do not keep their eyes on you. <laughs> So he's a bit of a bit of a horn dog, and his his dad's like super psyched, like hey, he likes women, and his mom's like no. <laughs> oh, I mean, family's gonna be family, right? It's pretty funny. So, uh, and then he he spends is this that part? Let's see. Uh, no, we're not there yet. But number two, uh, three does go into some depth here for sure. But he does make a point I don't want to skip here. He says, Nothing deserves to be more despised than vice. Yet I gave it more and more to vice simply in order to not be despised. And this is the part where he mentions he even pretended to sin to make other kids like him more. So, there you go. Theory of vice. Pretty interesting. Okay. Now he gets into the part of this, which I'll call the part that is uh, kind of the foci of the chapter. Or one of them. There's more than one. Uh, he gets into theft, actually. Uh, he says, this is four. He says, it is certain, O Lord, that theft is punished by your law, the law that is written in men's hearts and cannot be erased, however sinful they are. So this is a point, that, another point to make uh, philosophically, where there's actually a connection to Mencius here. But theologically, I think Christians do agree on this, but St. Augustine's very strong on it. Um, he thinks God's law is written in men's hearts. So that's your conscience. So everybody has a con a God conscience. That's what Christians would call it, right? Like God has given man a conscience to know what is right. And what's his proof? I actually really like his proof. It's here. Uh, the one I wrote on the slide, right? Thie theft. Even thief does not like to be robbed, right? Like you kind of know theft is wrong. He says here, for no thief can bear another thief should steal from him. Even though if he is rich and the other is driven to it by want. Somebody needs it. right? Even a rich thief hates to be robbed. They hate it, right? So we're like, wait a minute, if you're a thief and ethics are subjective, what, wouldn't you understand when you get robbed by another thief? Like, oh, it's kind of just? No, they, thieves get mad about it. Why? Because they know theft is wrong. They just don't like it when it happens to them. Uh, he says, yet I was willing to steal and steal I did. All this comes back to being personal, right? So this is one thing that makes the confessions a good, like, catechism, right, like a thing that teaches ethics and morals and basics, St. Augustine's not pretending to not do any of the things he's condemning. He's like, nope, look at me, I did it first, like, you know, you guys who are doing it, me too. <laughs> it makes him one of the, probably one of, probably my, the most sympathetic saint I've read, you know. He says, yet I was willing to steal, and steal I did, although I was not compelled by any lack, unless it were the lack of a sense of justice or distaste for what was right and a greedy love for doing wrong. And he says, he stole, he coveted, uh, the things he coveted by stealing, but only to enjoy the theft itself and the sin. And then this is where we get to the pear tree story. Uh, some authors like super focus on this one part of the book and go like, oh my god, a fight August of of theft with a pear tree. But, but he spends book two on it basically. But excuse me, super hot tea. But he um he brings this up. Let me read the story and then I'll I'll explain why I think he spends so much time on it. Quote: There was a pear tree near our vineyard, loaded with fruit that was attractive neither to look at nor to taste. Late one night, a band of ruffians, myself included, 
went off to shake the fruit and carry it away, for we had continued our games out of doors until well after dark. It was our pernicious habit. We took away an enormous quality of pears, not to eat them ourselves, but simply to throw them at the pigs. And as we all know, pigs eat everything. Perhaps we ate some of them, but our real pleasure consisted of doing something that was forbidden. So this is the key here. Uh, and he's giving an example. And the, I, I, my, my guess would be, this probably really bugged him. The fact they did this, right? They didn't need it. They didn't want it. They didn't even sell it for profit, right? Like, how can you say it? Like, it, like a material justification. It was pure... And then he's, the, the point of this chapter, he's trying to figure out why the heck would you do, because think about how we, it's the opposite of Mencius's point, or Confucius, right? And as a Christian point, like doing good because good is goodness. Is the, but if that's true, then the opposite could be true, right? People do evil for the sake of being evil. Oh my goodness. So if you think about that, that's actually really disrupt. like that's really disruptive, right? Like it's like when you get, like why is murder... Not for not for a, you know like a different reason or you got caught but you murder for the pleasure of murder. Why does that? Why is that more wrong? Does that make sense? So he's just picking this because this was his kind of example of one of his sins that was he did the sin for the sake of it, not for any of the ancillary like you know self justifications. And I, that is my hypothesis why he spends so much time on this. And let's see, we are here. And we'll get to that in a second. Oh, and where's the question he asks? Oh, yeah. Number five, he then gets into it. He tries to explain it. Um, he, so he's trying to break it down for himself. And that's basically the rest of this uh, chapter. He's trying to understand why would a human... And the human's him, right? But he, he abstracts it, too. You know, why would people, like, sin for sin's sake? He's trying to figure it out. So his pear tree story is his example of that in his life right like he's not doing it for any end just for the and the end is just to do the wrong thing and again um is this completely unrealistic do people ever do evil things to be evil i mean maybe you guys have had a sheltered life and never seen it i have definitely seen it um i mean happily or sadly i have kids i've seen my kids do things just for the sake of like hurting another person <laughs> you're just like oh man kids Oof, if kids do it, we all do it, you know. It's something. But then he talks about here, so that's, um, what things a symbol soul takes pressure in. He says, uh, five, this is on 48. He says, the eye is attracted to beautiful objects by gold, by silver, and all such things. There is great pleasure, too, in the feeling something agreeable to touch, and material things that have various qualities to please each other's senses. Again, it is gratifying to be held in esteem by other men, and have the power of giving them orders, and gaining mastery over them. This is also the reason why revenge is sweet. But our ambition to obtain all these things must not lead us astray from you, O Lord, nor must we depart from what your law allows. So he points out these are the things that we want in this world, uh, and it doesn't mean they're the best things. He gives an example of better things here. For example, um, the life we live on this earth has its own attractions as well, because it has a certain beauty of its own in harmony with all the rest of this world's beauty. Friendship among men, too, is delightful bond, uniting many souls in one. All of these things could, oh, it can be occasions of sin, because as good as they are, they are the lowest order of good. And if uh, we are too much tempted by them, we abandon those higher and better things, your truth, your law, and yourself. So like Plato, he, he's on the gradation of goodness, right? There's good things here, like the earth, he's not a Manichaean now, like at the end of this book, but... The, th the material things of this world have a good, but they're lesser goods than uh, intelligible goods, as Plato would say, or godly goods, as St. Augustine would say. But they're the same good, theoretically, in kind of uh, how we apply this. All right, uh, any questions before we move on? We're still in book two, but it's the end of a slide, and it's a point to ask a question. I'll give us 30 seconds while I sip my tea again, which is slowly quick.
somebody makes a comment. So basically, it's like having a rebellious mentality of feeling good to be bad. Yeah, and remember, we got to be careful with the words we use because we're in a philosophy, like we're doing philosophy, right? It would be feeling pleasure to be bad would be a more accurate Augustinian or Platonic or even a, a Stoic way to state it. Does that make sense? So good and feeling good to be bad, like even saying the word feeling good is a weird modern thing so it'd be more accurate to say like feeling pleasure in being bad does that make sense like that's more accurate verbally too but again we live in a very i'm not judging the person who asked it i'm just saying we live in a very verbally loose age where people forget words mean things yeah so that's the see even saying feeling good to be bad is a subversion why it's subverting the good <laughs> it's basically the person who says feeling good to be bad means there's no such thing as good Right, even the little phrases we learn can like subvert, kind of a what would you say, a moral understanding of reality. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's 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 the pleasure, right? The sensu the sensu sensuality of badness. And this is the thing, right? If somebody's going to argue for basically all of the authors we've studied so far, right? There's at least like a divine or spiritual element to morality. Um. There, there, you know that, that that there's a there's the opposite elements there too, right? If if there's a good morality and a good spirituality, there's probably an evil one too, right? The contrast both exist. Like, what else? What are we comparing to? So, yeah, it's a good observation for sure. All right, let's keep going. Um, theft. This is where he gets pretty deep into it. This is let me find out. This is section six. Uh, and he mentions it's what his unhappy soul desired, right? So, and again, we talk about using words, right? So, feeling desire for bad. That's another way you could say it. Um, six. Here we go. And he's, interestingly, he kind of, he starts six. He says, if the crime of theft, which I committed that night as a boy of 16, were a living thing, could I speak to it and ask it that to my shame... Oh, ask what he loved in it. He's curious. He's trying to... This is, again, this is an examine. He's trying to f examine himself and figure out. He mentions there's no beauty in the robbery itself. There's no beauty in the pairs except for God created them. So basically, again, this is a little more Christian, theolo you know, kind of philosophy. Uh, reality is good because God made it. Does that make sense? Like, it's not the most good, but it's generally speaking, created things are good. Um, something good to point out. I mean, in the material reality still should matter in an orthodox Christian setting. Um, but it's not the pair my unhappy soul desired. I had plenty of my own. Better than those... And I only picked them so I might steal. For no sooner had I picked them than I threw them away, and tasted nothing in them but my own sin, which I relished and enjoyed. Um, if only one part of those pears passed my lips, it was the sin that gave them flavor. And then he kind of examines here why this is basically an ethical examination. It looks like he's just like wallowing in his own. Man, my daughter's pissed. <laughs> She does not like the cold, dry, smoky air we've had for the last three days. Not a fan. So it's her first cold weather she's ever encountered. It's not, uh, I think she liked the heat better. Okay, so now let's keep going. Um, he, she tries to analyze it now. He says, so his question is, I ask what pleasure I had in that theft. I find it had no beauty to attract me. And he doesn't mean the beauty of justice or prudence. By the way, we're getting two of the uh, Greek virtues reinstituted as Christian virtues. So, justice and prudence possess nor the beauty of a man's mind in his memory of a life that animates him, nor the beauty of the stars allotted to their places of the earth of the sea, teeming with new life. Not those goods. And he said, it did not even have the shadowy, deceptive beauty which makes vice attractive. So it's almost, this is funny, he's saying it's worse than vice. So we're basically examining, like, where is this feeling come from? And he gives other examples. So uh, he gives, now we're going to get a list of vices. So if you're curious, like, what are the things that, uh, you know, St. Augustine thinks you shouldn't be doing? First, he says, pride for interest, which is the pretense of superiority. And why is that a sin? Here we go. It's intimidating yours, for you alone are God, supreme overall. So pride is like, 
why is it bad for a Christian? You're basically raising yourself up to the level of God. So that's why it's a, a negative. Um, other ones, here we go. Um, man, she's passed. Ambition, which is only craving for honor and glory when you alone are to be honored before all, and you alone are the glorious forever. So basically, what's wrong with ambition? You're competing with God. <laughs> Right? So you're like, I will gather honor as much as God. And St. Augustine's like, ah, yeah, but... God. And then he goes, cruelty is the weapon of the powerful used to make others fear them. Yet none is to be feared but God alone, from whose power nothing can be snatched away or stolen, or by any means or any time or places or means. So he mentions cruelty, right? So cruelty itself, why is cruelty bad? Well, it's basically you're try a human trying to make other humans fear them instead of fearing God. So again, we're getting into the ethics, kind of. like the, These are the more the negative ethics, but we'll get into positive ethics, too. Uh, he already mentioned prudence and justice, and we'll get into justice more later, too. Um, but here we go. Uh, more. The lustful use caressed to win the love they crave for. Yet no caress is sweeter than your charity, and no love more rewarding than the love of your truth. So there we go. We got two more positive virtues giving compared to lust. So uh, charity of God and love of God's truth, and, uh, which shines in beauty above all else. So, this is again, there's literally a shining truth metaphor. Where does the shining truth metaphor, where did we see that before? We saw that in Plato's Intelligible Reality. Right, so again, we're seeing these kind of descriptions of truth that are uh, uh, building on each other. They're not completely alien, right? So, Plato, Marcus, St. Augustine, they have a link together, right? It's not, it's not, they're in a similar tradition. It's not exactly the same, right? But they're definitely pulling from similar sources of explaining of reality. Just like we saw with Mencius Confucius, and we will see when we get to Tale of Heike. But we're not there yet. Ah, there's almost like a th theme here, man. Uh, let's keep going, though. Inquisitiveness has all the appearance of a thirst for knowledge, yet you have supreme knowledge of all things. So there's like a raw, there's a right and wrong inquisitiveness. Like being inquisitive could be bad if you're going for the wrong thing. Uh, this is too. I love this next one, and probably the professor in me loves it too much. Ignorance too, and stupidity choose to go under the mask of simplicity and innocence, <laughs> because you are simplicity itself, and no innocence is greater than yours. So remember, simplicity in this case, this is an interesting thing, this is the Greek definition, not the modern, which is like a euphemism for dumb. Simplicity means, divine simplicity is a Greek idea that the Christians eventually use. I mean, early on, right, this is St. Augustine, so he's using it uh, from the beginning. Um, divine simplicity is the idea that um, there's nothing complex in it. Remember we talked about the forms of Aristotle? Uh, the eternal things of, or sorry, Plato, the, the, the forms of Plato basically are simple. They're one thing, like they're oneness. So this is, saying God is simple doesn't mean he's dumb. It means God is like a unity in himself. Same thing with uh, um, innocence, right? Innocence means no guilt. <laughs> so again, right, that's a good thing. It, and again, this is where words have been kind of changed. Nowadays, innocence means like you don't understand like the true reality. Yeah, but if innocence means like guiltlessness, wouldn't we want to be guiltless? Isn't that better than being guilty? I, I don't, you know what I mean? Like the way we use words has definitely changed. Um, and he says, uh, you are innocent even in the harm which overtakes the wicked, for as the result of their own actions. This answers again that question somebody asked earlier. Uh, if God didn't create sin and evil, where does it come from? This is the answer here. Um, when harm overtakes the wicked, why not? Why isn't it God's fault, quote-unquote? It is the result of their own action. So basically, sin is a just punishment that wicked people inflict on themselves. Like, God doesn't even, like, God created this, the, the kind of, the, for an uh, Augustinian sense, created the just structure of reality. And then, by you going against it, you inflict punishment on yourself. So, it's a, that's a free will point, basically. Again, we're getting interesting kind of metaphysics in this as well, if you pay attention. Um, he keeps going, Sloth poses as the love of peace. <laughs> Yet, who is certain peace is there besides the Lord? Right? Some people who are slothful, right? They refuse to work, pretend they're being peaceful. This sounds like a hippie. <laughs> Oh, but right, the problem with sloth is you're given ability and you choose not to use it. Extravagance masquerades as fullness and abundance, right? Oh, there we go again. But you are the full, unfailing store of never-dying sweetness. So extravagance, 
can look like fullness or abundance, but if it's, it's going over the top. Um, here we go, another one. The spendthrift takes the pretense of liberality. And if you remember, liberality is the right, uh, right use of your money. Right, so not saving too much, not spending too much. But he says the contrast. You are the most generous dispenser of all good. So, again, we're, he's comparing all of these vices and good things to the standard of God, right? He has an objective standard. So being a spendthrift, a.k.a. never spending your money, is also a vice. Uh, he keeps doing covetousness. You uh, want many possessions for themselves. You possess all. So, again, right, if you covet, like, you want other people's stuff... But you're competing with the guy who literally is the origin of all stuff. <laughs> so he's kind of showing you, like, the futility of it. That's the, And he says, envious struggle for preferment. But what is to be preferred before you? So, like, why would we want to be preferred by other men if God can prefer? And he goes into anger, demands reven vengeance or revenge. But what vengeance is just as yours? Uh, here's another one, right? Fear shrinks from any sudden unwanted danger which threatens the things that it loves, for it is only care and safety. But you, oh, um, but to you nothing is strange, nothing unforeseen. And then uh, no one can part your, from you things that you love, and safety is assured nowhere but in you. So fear is also a negative, right? Uh, grief eats away at the heart for the loss of things which it took pleasure in desiring. So what is grief? This sounds almost Confucian or Buddhist, right? Grief is, it eats away your heart for the loss of things which you took pleasure in desiring. Because it wants to be like you from whom nothing can be taken away. Right? So why do we have grief? We'd like the things to never be taken away. And for St. Augustine, he's like, well, in God, uh, nothing can be taken away. And it keeps going. He goes into love. Um, the soul defiles itself with unchaste love when it turns away from you and looks elsewhere for things which it cannot find pure and unsullied and except returning to you. So in a way he's um, and he, put, he says here, all who desert you and themselves uh, set themselves up against you merely to copy you in a perverse way. Uh, by this act of imitation they only show that you are the creator of all nature and consequently that there is no place whatsoever for a man to hide away from you. So for him, he went all throughout, he actually comes back to theft. <laughs> Uh, but we'll get there in a second. But that big old list is there to kind of explain. I guess the peer, fear point would have been here. That was this one, wasn't it? Oh, no, that's the next section. Man. So, uh, but th this examine, he's doing it to kind of, it's it's a pot. It could just be he's saying, like, here's all these bad things. He's trying to, like, find the boundaries of, like, if there is sin, right, then there is a law you can violate. So here's the law. And how can he prove it? He, notice he doesn't use a bunch of, like, Bible quotes. He uses logic. Again, that's why this is philosophy and not just pure religion. Um, uh, he makes the example that people trying to set them up as copies of God proves there's a God. <laughs> so people are trying to have all these goods. This is the funny part, right? Like, all of the, the things he lists as sins... What makes them sins, like we talked about earlier in the in the classic definition, is they're away from God, right? People are trying to like set up little fiefdoms away from God. And for St. Augustine, he's trying to say that like it's actually proof of God because people are trying to do it. Very, and this is one of the more interesting proofs for God, in my opinion. Um, and again, it's pure logic. He doesn't, and he's using traits you could say that are like Christian, you know, derived. But he is, he's, he is attempting to be pretty logical, which is very interesting. Uh, now, seven, he gets into... Oh, before that, though, he talks at the end here. In conclusion, he says, What is it, then, that pleased me in my act of theft? And he actually doesn't answer it yet. He says, he keeps asking, like, uh, Since I had no real power to break the law, I enjoyed the pretense of doing so like a prisoner who creates for himself an illusion of liberty by doing something wrong when he has no fear of punishment under a feeble hallucination of power. Here was the slave who ran away from the master and chased a shadow instead. So he is not in a good mood right now. Um, but yeah, that's a pretty interesting uh, kind of, it definitely explains the basics. Okay, let's see. 
Now he mentions, this is interesting though, he just did that really kind of, you could say, almost depressing thing. But he points out he doesn't have any fear anymore. Now, why not? This is where we get again more, this is where he, he just did a bunch of negative things. But he leads back to a positive. Um, he says, my ability to recall these things with, can I recall these things with no fear in my soul? Right? Like, if he just did all that stuff, like, and he knows it all from personal experience. And if he believes that there's this judging God that will crush him, right? Like, it's Zeus, you know, Jupiter with the thunderbolts. Shouldn't he be terrified? Um, and he says, well, you have forgiven me such great sins and such wicked deeds. I acknowledge that it was by your grace and mercy uh, you melted away my sins like ice. And I acknowledge, too, that by your grace I was preserved from whatever sins I did not commit. For there was no knowing what I might have done, since I loved evil even if it served no purpose. And he says, I have vowed that you have forgiven me all, both sins which I committed of my own accord and those which, by your guidance, I was spared from committing. So that uh, that's basically, if you're, what does grace and mercy mean? That's it. So God forgave him all the sins, that he, and he didn't earn it, right? So that's grace. And the mercy is God helped him, per, per, like, didn't, he could have done worse. He's like, I've got a very creative imagination. I'm sure there's more horrible things I could have done. So that's kind of the, why doesn't he fear it? That's seven. It's He's pointing out that there's positive traits to God, right? It's not just judgment, it's, right, to quote him, God melted his sins like ice. That is mercy, right? So if you're like, what does mercy mean? Um, you do all these horrible things, and then you get forgiven those things. Oh, right? Uh, and if it's a, for the worldly kind of example, think of like a normal king, right? I know we don't live in monarchies anymore, which is, you know, too bad. But <laughs> um, mercy is when you literally, you, you had no defense at all, and you go to the judge, which is the king, and you beg for mercy. Right, you do not deserve it, but you completely repent. To this, by the way, this happened a lot in real life. Um, you'd beg the king for forgiveness. You know, you promise restitution. You know, you'd ask for clemency and mercy, uh, and it happened. Right, uh, and you could argue just kings probably did it more than unjust kings. And it's not just the Christian tradition, right? This happened in Rome. This happened in the Confucian tradition. Uh, probably, if you ask me, what's one modern problem with our court system? There's not enough mercy in it. Does that make sense? Like. Definitely, crime should be punished, um, but if it's all punishment and no mercy, the system isn't very just. Does that make, you know what I mean? Like, think about how many 18-year-olds have had their life destroyed by one major mistake at 18. So, you know, something to think about. I mean, imagine, I, I just had that image, uh, the image in my mind. Imagine St. Augustine and his friends got caught vandalizing a pear tree in a, in a city nowadays. I think in the countryside you could still get away with it. But imagine you're like in a modern city where the cops come down like a ton of bricks and these kids are like, let's say they're not 16, they're like 18 and they like vandalized a pear tree. They're like, oh, it's a felony. It's a gang action. You're all going to jail for 10 years. <laughs> I, should, <coughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I can imagine that happening and that's sad. Oh, yeah. So maybe we need to work on that. Okay. Now, he then goes into, that was a long, seeming aside, right? And then we get to 8, and he mentions that basically the theft brought no happiness. He's, and he says this at the beginning of 8. It brought no happiness for what harvest I did reap from acts which now make me blush. It's particularly an act of theft. I love nothing in it except the thieving. Oof. So he points out in the end, he, he loved thieving for thieving's sake. And he says, I cannot truly speak that it's a quote-unquote thing I could love. Only that I was more miserable because of it. And he mentions, too, I don't think I would have done it on my own. He's like, uh, he, was it then that I enjoyed the company of those I committed with the crime? He asks, is there something else? And then something else, um, he, he's not 100% sure if he can express it himself, but he has some feeling. I might have committed the crime on my own if I had needed to do it. Um, no more than with my uh, win myself the pleasure. Um, he says here, I should have no, had no need to kindle my glowing desire by rubbing shoulders with a gang of accomplices. But as it was not only the fruit that gave me pleasure, I must have got it from the crime itself, from the thrill of having partners in sin. 
So again, we're more complicated. So it was even more fun. Like, it was more pleasurable because he did it with basically a group. So basically, it's this, right? The prank itself was better as a group. And this is nine. He elaborates more. Uh, how can I explain my mood? Like, he's going deep into this. Uh, I was certainly a very vile frame of mind. Um... He says, we were tickled with laughter by the prank we had played because no one suspected us of it, although the owners were furious. Why was it then? I thought it fun not to have been the only culprit. Perhaps it was because we do not easily laugh when we are alone. True enough. But even when a man is all by himself uh, and quite alone, sometimes he cannot help but laughing. But yeah, he's leaving this to God. He's like, man, this is something. And then I'll leave it out of time, so I'll leave it here. He finally, at the end, he uh, he has a good question: Who can untangle all these knots? He's like, I don't know. And again, he calls the whole thing an abomination. As he started, I shudder to look and think of such abomination. I long instead for innocence and justice, grateful and splendid eyes, and the sight whose sight is undefiled. So again, the whole reason he did this is a. Uh, um, just for, like for peace but also for the example and he got to do that kind of examine and he says in my youth uh but i deserted you O god in my youth i wandered away too far from your sustaining hand and created myself a barren waste so he's again he's showing he's trying to understand like the ethics of like evil for evil's sake it's like a reverse of trying to do the mentious so it's it's an interesting aside now we're like i said we're a little slower than i expected we didn't get to three Although I only had one slide of three. So we're technically all, we're about as behind as we started. But we are out of time. I don't want to take your guys' time because you might have another class. So if you have questions, um, I'll answer them in the Discord. Otherwise, be free. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll do three and four and maybe a bit of five next uh, Tuesday. Your papers are also due Tuesday. And as I said, if you have any trouble or need questions, I don't have an office hour, but feel free to message me on Discord, and I'll get back to you when I see it. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Um, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye now.